Well, um, this morning as we get ready to get started, I just uh, wanted to um, welcome everybody again. We're glad that you're here. Um, let's bow our heads for just a brief word of prayer as we begin the message, okay? Father in heaven, send your Holy Spirit to each one of us. Please, dear Lord, we pray for an outpouring of your spirit on, on our churches and on us. Uh, use these words to bring glory and, and honor to your name, I pray in Jesus' name. You know, I thought I would begin this morning by telling you a little story about a friend of mine by the name of John Wilmot. Um, I met John Wilmot uh, when I was at Andrews University. And um, uh, John Wilmot uh, was from India. He was Indian, but he was he had an English name. But what was interesting about John was that we worked together in the housing maintenance department. We were taking classes at the seminary. He was ahead of me because he was actually already an experienced uh, pastor and evangelist, and I'll tell you a little bit more about him. Um, but we worked together in the maintenance department. He was working on a doctor of ministry, and I was working on my Master of Divinity from the seminary. Um, I had been there in the maintenance department longer than John, so I was the one who many times wound up giving him his work orders. And um, <clears throat> even had to ask him to go back and redo a job one one time because it wasn't done quite right the first time. But he was one of the quietest and probably one of the humblest people I think I've ever known. Uh, he worked for the Seventh-day Adventist Church, not as a local pastor, but on the division level. He was the evangelist uh, for the Southern Asia uh, Division and later became uh, the vice president of that division. Um, but uh, what was interesting about John was he was one of the quietest and most humble men I think I've ever known. And it wasn't until uh, years later when I got to talking to my brother-in-law, Mark, that I, I learned that he was, that John was one of the most successful evangelists the church has ever had. And he was responsible for thousands of baptisms. Uh, in fact, one time he was so quiet. One time I my, the church where Sandy and I were attending in Paw, Paw, Michigan, the pastor asked me if I could get somebody from the seminary to come preach. And so I went to Sandy and said, you know, John's just so quiet. I'm going to find out what this guy is. How did this guy get to where he is? He's just such a quiet person. And so I went and asked him if he would preach. Well, 40 some years after that Sabbath, I can still tell you what he preached on. I can't do that for myself, but I can do it for him because he was that good. And uh, it seemed, you know, like uh, I, I knew him, but I didn't really know him. I didn't really know who he was. And I didn't know the caliber of this, this great Christian man who was a, a leader in the church and was an evangelist. I'm guessing that there are many people that um, we know that we don't really know. And I'm guessing that there are many people who profess to know Jesus Christ. But I think it's entirely possible that many who claim to know him don't really know who he is. I want to begin today by telling you that if you do not understand who Christ is, you don't understand the real message of the Bible. The Apostle John, in his account of the life of Christ, makes one theme the center of everything he says. The great theme in the Gospel of John and in John's writings, right from the beginning, is the eternal nature of Jesus Christ that he was one with the Father throughout eternity. The, the verse that you've heard me quote, you know, frequently, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There is a mystery to the incarnation that we will always fall short of fully understanding. But even the prophets, centuries in advance of the of the events of the Bible, of the New Testament, prophesied of the coming of one who would be Lord of all. Isaiah prophesying about the coming of the Messiah used words that we hear every Christmas time. Isaiah 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And listen carefully now to the names by which this child is called. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You notice that the same names used for the Father are used for the Son as well. 
Many have gotten confused about the Bible's portrayal of Christ as if Jesus somehow is lower than the Father or is in some fashion still a created being versus one with the Father throughout eternity. Now, this isn't a sermon on the Trinity, but there are a few verses that are important to keep in mind. First of all, we have John 1's declaration of Jesus being the word who was with God and who was God. Second of all, we have Genesis 1 that does something quite interesting when it describes the creation of humanity. Here's what it says, and listen carefully to what it says in John, Genesis 1, verse 26. <clears throat> then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. <laughs> it's interesting that even Jewish scholars who reject the idea of a trinity are at a loss for why the original Hebrew uses the plural term us in Genesis when it describes creation. One more passage, John 14, verses 15 through 18, it says, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he, meaning the helper, may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be, with, and will be in you. Jesus used his personal pronouns in every, every phrase as he describes the coming of the Holy Spirit. And Christ will later tell us to baptize in the names of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you what I think. There are mysteries about the incarnation of Christ, and there are mysteries about the true nature of the Trinity. The Bible asserts both of these teachings. It doesn't go out of its way to explain them, in large part because there will always be aspects of infinite divinity that finite human beings will never understand. There is a point at which endeavoring to understand things that are beyond our reach becomes disrespectful. I've heard explanations about the Trinity that wind up treating the topic in a fashion that it almost sounds blasphemous. It's dangerous to reach beyond that which God has chosen to reveal. But I think that I have a simple explanation that is as far as I'm willing to go. I think that the three members of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are one in nature, in power, and in authority. They are described as one. They are in complete accord, in complete unity, in complete harmony. But for the sake of all intelligent created beings, I think that they have adopted roles and titles that we can understand, a father we can understand, a son we can understand, the relationship between a father and a son we grasp. And as we begin to understand the relationship between breath and life, we begin to understand the workings of the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us about the existence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then it leaves us to accept it by faith. And I believe that, as I have said earlier, anything that denies Christ his rightful supremacy is, is the spirit of Antichrist. Anyone who tries to suggest that Christ is not one with the Father from eternity is defrauding Christ of the honor that his, is his by right. But one more look at, at, at something in the Gospel of John. John chapter 1, verse 2. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. The same is said in, elsewhere in the Bible, in Hebrews 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the worlds. If you don't get this one point, you've missed the central point of the New Testament. John in Hebrews is telling us that Christ is none other than the creator of heaven and earth. If you understand this one point, then you understand that when this earth was created, it was Jesus who spoke and the dry land appeared. It was Christ who spoke and the sun, moon, and the stars came into existence. 
if you understand what the New Testament is telling us, then you understand that when humanity was created, it was Christ who took the clay from the ground and with his own hands formed Adam and breathed, it, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. It was Christ who took a rib from Adam's side and made Adam's partner Eve. And when humanity sinned, it was Christ who stepped off the throne he shared with his father and said, I must save my children. Just a little later on in John, he says something that's almost haunting as you, as it talks about the arrival of Christ. In John 1 verse 10, it says, he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. You know, if you've ever had a child turn away from you saying, I don't want you. I don't love you. Then you've tasted just the tiniest piece of what Christ must have felt as he came to save children who owed their existence to him, but who wanted no part of him. But if it's true that Christ is the creator of heaven and earth, then it's also true that he was the one who led Israel in the wilderness and who gave them the Ten Commandments at Sinai. You know, in John 8, it's a pivotal chapter in the Gospel of John. When Christ is talking to the religious leaders, he uses a term for himself that would have been blasphemous if it wasn't true. He says to them, before Abraham was, I am. Those listening to him knew exactly what he was saying. When Moses met God at the burning bush to receive his orders to lead Israel out of Egypt, he said, who shall I say sent me? God's answer is tell them that the I am hath sent me to you. Jesus in John 8 is taking for himself a name that belonged to God alone, the I am, the self-existent one. The Bible tells us that those who were listening to Christ were so upset that they tried to stone him, but he just disappeared and walked through them and left. The very next chapter is a story that took me a long time to understand. And John 9 is found the story of the man born blind. It tells us that Jesus stops, spits on the ground, and makes something. Do you remember what it was? Some translations say that he made mud. The New King James Version actually gets it right. It says that he made clay and pressed it into the man's eyes. If you know the creation story, doesn't that? catch you? He had just claimed to be the I am of the Old Testament. He has just claimed the title of the creator, the self-existent one. And now he does what the creator does. He creates for this man something that he didn't have, eyes. Later on, when Jesus hears that the man has been thrown out of the temple because of his faith in him, he, he seeks out this man and speaks to him. John 9, verses 35 and on, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, he said to him, do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Now, when the angel Gabriel in Revelation appears to the apostles, so John, John falls down to worship him. And Gabriel says, do not do that. I am a fellow servant. Worship God. But Christ now receives the worship of the man born blind. Christ receives worship because he is the creator of heaven and earth. He receives worship because it's his right to receive it. And it is, and it is a sin for us to give it to anyone else. Remember, I said earlier, in the last sermon, that in this great controversy, this battle between Christ and Satan, it became the purpose of Satan to dispute the supremacy of Christ in everything. It is the spirit of Antichrist to deny, to deny what Christ, what is his right to receive. It is, uh, uh, you know, it is the spirit of Antichrist to, to try and steal the worship that belongs to Christ alone. You know, interestingly enough, when Christ goes into the wilderness after his baptism, he's, he's tempted by Satan for 40 days. 
And the last of the three temptations comes in Matthew 4, verses 8 and on. It says, again, the devil took him up to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. You know that Satan was cast out of heaven in the first place for coveting the glory and honor and the worship that belonged to Christ. It was the greatest act of arrogance to stand before his creator and attempt to claim worship from him. But it's still his obsession. In Revelation chapters 13 and 14, when you read, you realize that the central issue at the end of time is worship, the worship of the beast versus the worship of God, allegiance to the beast or allegiance to the creator. In fact, even the Sabbath becomes a reminder of Christ's role as creator and becomes part of the controversy. Revelation 14 tells us of the message of the first angel that gives a special call in Revelation 14, verse 6. It says, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water, a phrase that literally comes almost word for word out of the fourth commandment, which is the Sabbath commandment. Worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. It's a call back to our allegiance to Christ, a call back to worshiping Christ as our Lord and our creator. It's an allegiance we owe him. If Christ is our creator, then this message of the angel is a call to allegiance and loyalty to him. If Christ is the one to whom we owe our existence, then this message is a call to obedience to him, to worship him who made the heavens, the earth. In fact, it brings us full circle to a passage that by now you must know is my, my hobby horse. John 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. The Sabbath is a reminder of our relationship to Christ, that he is our creator. The Sabbath is a reminder that we owe our existence to him. The war that we've been studying about the great controversy is going to continue to the very end. The devil will work to destroy or distort everything that testifies to the power and authority of Christ. He does that even on an individual level. Satan is always tempting us away from our allegiance to Christ. You know, most of the major issues in life have clear instructions as to how we are to deal with them. The Ten Commandments are comprehensive enough that every issue of importance in life is dealt with. But just as he approached Eve, Satan comes to us and says, did God say that you shouldn't do that? Ah, it's really no big deal. Don't worry about it. Or it's okay this time. I'm sure you can get away with it. It shouldn't be a problem this time. Or if you try to follow those rules too closely, you're going to lose out. Just this once will be okay. Satan tries again and again to tempt us over the line to disregard our loyalties and allegiance to Jesus. Same tactics that Satan used on Adam and Eve, he uses on us. He makes us think that we can't live without this or we won't survive without that. Whole great controversy, the whole thing from beginning to end is about choices and the outcome of those choices. Lucifer, one of the greatest of the angels, chose to covet the glory that he had as if it came from him, forgetting that it belonged to God, that God was the source of his glory. Adam and Eve covenanted, coveted a knowledge that belonged to God alone, and they sinned. The great controversy is even about the choices of God. He could have wiped the earth clean and started over again. He could have snapped his fingers and humanity would have disappeared. But instead, the Son and the Father and the Holy Spirit entered into a plan by which humanity could be saved. 
They chose to redeem rather than destroy. They chose to save humanity rather than to eliminate it. Christ himself covenanted to give his life as a payment for sin. And again, the freedom to choose is given back to us. The Holy Spirit pleads with our hearts. We've been given a second chance because of Jesus. We've been given the chance to choose. The Holy Spirit pleads with us. He speaks to our hearts and minds. He, he pesters us about, he, about the things we know that, that should change. He points out Jesus hanging on the cross. And he says, look, look at him. Christ calls to us and says, look to me and be saved. The great controversy is really not a battle for territory or authority. The battle is being waged over the hearts of men and women. So who has your heart today? Who's in control of your heart? It's not hard to figure out where things are going. Just look at the nature of the decisions you've been making. Do they indicate a loyalty to Christ? Or do they indicate a loyalty to something else? Here's the good news. Christ has made atonement for every sin. By looking to Jesus, your sins can be forgiven and washed away. You can be, Christ can wash away the sins of your life with his own blood. And the father looks at you as if you had never sinned because of his son. But more than that, Christ has helped us. He has promised to help us to overcome sin. First John 1 verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So there's the forgiveness. But it goes on, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He offers to, to remove the guilt and to transform us. He offers to forgive us for our sins, but to change us and purify us by dwelling in our hearts through faith. So what do you think? Who wants to declare their allegiance to Jesus Christ today? Who wants to say, Lord, in this battle, I want everyone to know that my loyalties are to you. There isn't an earthly kingdom that deserves an earthly government, an earthly place that deserves more loyalty than Jesus. Our first allegiance, in fact, our sole allegiance is to Jesus Christ, to his kingdom, to him as our Lord and Savior. Who wants to say, Lord, in this battle, I want everyone to know that my loyalties are to you. Lord Jesus, take possession of my heart. I give it to you. Lord, win the battle, not only in the world, but in my heart. So what do you think? Is that your, is that your allegiance? Is that your loyalty? Let me pray with you. Father in heaven. We know that in this great war, there's such a temptation to leave the path of obedience to you for something we want or something we desire. We pray, dear Lord, for the indwelling of your Holy Spirit. We pray for your power in our lives that we might live for you. Oh, Lord, we want to pronounce before everyone that our allegiance is to you, that our loyalty is to you. Lord Jesus, be shaped within us through the infilling and the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us, please. In this great struggle, we surrender the battle of our hearts to you and ask that you take possession and take ownership of us. We give ourselves to you again today. Bless us, Lord, please, and bless everybody hearing this message. Draw their hearts to you. Win their loyalty to you. And keep us faithful in Jesus' name. Amen. In this great struggle between good and evil, the battle continues and will continue to the day that Jesus comes. But you belong to Christ now. Remember who your Lord is. Remember where your first loyalties are. Begin to live your life by the grace of the Holy Spirit and begin to live your life demonstrating in everything you do that you belong to Jesus. You're his property. I remember somebody got arrested one time and as a Christian and um, when they started asking him questions, all he would say was, this is an early Christianity. All he would say was, I am a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And of course, Christianity was so new that nobody really knew who that was. And they kept saying, what is he talking about? He belongs to somebody named Jesus Christ. The person kept saying, I am the slave. I belong to Jesus Christ. I am his property. He owns my heart. He owns me. What about it? Are you willing to submit yourself to be ruled by Jesus Christ? I hope so. God bless all of you today.